Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's great to be here, and, and I very much appreciate the invitation. It's been a great conference, and uh, what I'm going to try to do is shift gears a little bit and talk about the lived reality of real people, uh, not just the theory, but how real families are, are dealing with this. And um, I'm going to share some results from a, an IRB-approved study. Uh, Nico and I have uh, patients and our team, families coming uh, to Wild Cornell and Rockefeller for uh, neuroimaging, uh, EEG, fMRI study, et cetera. And in tandem with the scientific studies, I've been doing in-depth uh, longitudinal interviews with families, and we're up to now like 52 families, which is the largest uh, cohort of anecdotes in the world, I think, on this topic. Um, and uh, it, we're using qualitative methods and uh, a kind of ethnographic. And, and this is all going to be uh, part of a book uh, that Matt just mentioned is coming out next year. And, and, you know, despite the exciting science that we just heard about all, all morning, uh, these families, uh, irrespective of race, ethnicity, how rich they are, how poor they are, what part of the country they come from, encounter a rather disinterested healthcare system. Um, there's a presumption the brain is not resilient, that, that, uh, that the brain uh, doesn't recover, there's nihilism, uh, the brain doesn't change over time. All this is contrary to what we're coming to understand. And what happens uh, within the context of uh, acute care hospitalization is that there are, in my view, premature decisions to withhold or withdraw life-sustaining therapy. My last book was on palliative care. I'm a big advocate for end-of-life care but it's got to be informed, and sometimes uh, the, the prognosis and the possibility of these brain states are misrepresented. Um, families are, are often prompted to be, uh, have their loved ones become organ donors before they've declared themselves prognostically, uh, and, and again, premature palliative care recommendations. You know, palliative care is never premature, it's always on time, but when it leads to the sense that uh, it's time for you to die, then I think it's problematic. Those families that kind of get through the, that, that acute care gauntlet um, are often discharged uh, while patients are medically unstable to places that are ill-suited uh, to ongoing care for these, uh, for these people, uh, and then they get inadequate rehabilitation. Um, and so I'm going to talk about some of the reasons wh why I think this is the case, because there's a lingering kind of cultural penumbra that's, that's informing all the work that we do, and then, and then uh, briefly go through some of the, the stories and conclude by talking about some of the reimbursement issues that we've recently encountered uh, and some health care policy questions and some legal questions, and then close by arguing that, that I, I'm going to argue that consciousness is a civil right, and that if you're conscious, you deserve it to be recognized and, and perhaps augmented so you can maximally integrate yourself into civil society, a la the Americans with Disabilities Act. But let's, let's start at the beginning and try to put this into the context of uh, Bioethics 102. How's that? Um, and that is the, just the iconic importance of the vegetative state to, to the evolution of American bioethics. I mean, there are two sort of landmark decisions in the 70s, you know, the, the Roe v. Wade case and the, and the Quinlan case, and both have kind of articulated the right of self-determination, autonomy, bodily integrity. And, 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 and in, the, in the right to die movement really evolved as a, as a derivative of that as the negative right to be left alone. And it was in the, in the context of this is Karen Ann Quinlan, a young woman uh, who had a presumptive drug overdose, was vegetative, her family wanted to withdraw care, and the judge, uh, Judge Hughes in New Jersey, uh, argued that it was morally and ethically and legally warranted because it was futile because of her loss of her cognitive safety at state. Again, conflation, consciousness, cognition, it goes back to the beginning as you were, as you were suggesting earlier. But uh, Judge Hughes uh, invoked uh, the, the uh, testimony of, uh, of Fred Plum, who was our teacher, Nico and I, and, and, and this is a picture of Dr. Plum from 1976, and as Nico mentioned, he and Brian Jeanette in 1972 wrote the landmark Lancet paper about a syndrome without a name that the, uh, about the vegetative state. And Judge Hughes, who uh, had been governor of New Jersey, was himself a Catholic, um, wrote, it was indicated by Dr. Plum the brain works in essentially two ways, the vegetative and the sapient, so brainstem, higher cortical function. And we have no hesitancy to decide that there's no external compelling interest of the state to compel Karen to endure. Now, it's interesting to be unendurable. She's vegetative, uh, but it's kind of, you read through the case, it's like she's dying of cancer, and she's having an uh, unendurable death. It's kind of interesting. Only to vegetate a few more measurable months with no realistic possibility of returning to any semblance of cognitive or sapient life. 
Um, and, and that became sort of the touchstone for the right to die movement. And over the, the subsequent 40 years, um, doctors became acculturated to the right to die. Uh, vegetative state became the ultimate in medical futility just after brain death, which was established in 1968, and we're still fighting it over, over that with the McMath case. Uh, but the presumption was in these brain states nothing can or should be done, that the injuries were immutable. And the image that many people my, of my generation have is, is of the Quinlan uh, uh, autopsy that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine of a liquefied, gelatinous, gelled brain that weighed half of its normal weight. And, and it was kind of a static, just there kind of situation. Uh, and this notion held in the Cruzan decision um, and, in the, and in Shivo. But what happened was it got overgeneralized to all severe brain injury. And even as we were focused on the vegetative state almost obsessively, there were these exceptions that kept on popping up. And you say, well, you know, are they vegetative? Are they what? And of course, they were the minimally conscious people that we now know in retrospect that they were. But we kind of had a, a neglect syndrome. Those of you who are the neurologists in the room will know that if you have a parietal lobe lesion, you don't see half of your visual field. They're out of your gaze. Um, and these people were out of our societal gaze. And, and we responded to them as if they were vegetative and conflated them the way we treat them with the vegetative. And in fact, they're often confused with the vegetative for, for polemical reasons in the case of the Shivo case and also methodologically because when they're not demonstrating their behaviors, they look vegetative. <laughs> so it's very hard to distinguish, uh, not biologically, as Nico eloquently said earlier, but practically in the real world, they often get confused. Um, so this is, a, this, is, this is a kind of statement that you see uh, that kind of captures this. Uh, this is Dr. Vidjix, who is the head of the Enduro Intensive Care Unit at the Mayo Clinic. And just note the title of the paper, The Family Conference, End of Life Guidelines at Work for Comatose Patients. Now we now know, you know, based on the, the morning's uh, lectures, that comatose is a self-limited state, uh, eyes closed self-limited state in the last two weeks. So you're, you're generalizing now based on a two-week, you know, uh, bout of information what we should do with people before they even had a chance to declare themselves. But the attending physician, the patient with a devastating il il illness, will have to come to terms with the futility of care. Families who are unconvinced, they should have diminished expectations for what ICU care can accomplish and the withdrawal of life support or abstaining from interventions is more commensurate with the neurologic status. And of course, there are times when that's totally appropriate, but it's not all the time, and, and we have to distinguish it. Here's another uh, example uh, from, from one of our uh, family members. This is a young man who was about to be deployed to Iraq as a Marine who was a pedestrian and got hit by a car in Philadelphia. And the mother said this in the, in the transcript. And actually, I had a neurologist tell me, your son is basically just an organ donor now. And I asked when that happened. So this is within the first 72 hours, so early on, right? And she said, well, he doesn't have the neurologist. He doesn't have the reflexes of a frog. And I, of course, was as stunned as you are just now. And I asked, he doesn't have the reflexes of a frog? And the mother said, of a frog. He said, you should really just consider him being an organ donor. That's the best thing you can do for your son. And I said, I completely disagree with you. I'm making, not making him an organ donor. Go back in there and do the best you can. Now, I want to deconstruct this a little bit. I wrote my college thesis on Lacan, so you'll forgive a little deconstruction. <laughs> um, but, but I don't think it's that, that that ER doc was a bad doctor or a bad guy. It's just that he's overgeneralized the experience from most of medical care that when you lose consciousness, the gig is up. It's, you know, end stage consciousness. 80% of people who are made do not resuscitate are made so by surrogates when their loved ones lose consciousness. It's the rare patient who makes himself a, a DNR. Um, and so what we have here is that in brain injury, the loss of consciousness could be the end. It could be the end of the beginning of the end, but it also could be the beginning of a recovery. And they lose consciousness as part of their trajectory. So, so there's a kind of a disanalogy there. And, and I think that what's imp imp uh, uh, sort of implied here is that if you lose consciousness, like the person who has end-stage disease and is unconscious, you're never going to get better. And this is a tension that has been going on in brain injury for millennia. And here is a, uh, the, 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 the cathedral ceiling at the Montreal Neurologic Institute, designed by the great Wilder Penfield, the neurosurgeon and neuroscientist, in which there are early representations of the uh, brain uh, in the center, hieroglyphics, Greeks, Greek, the, and the Greek around it is Galen refuting the Hippocratic uh, aphorism 
that, that all brain injuries were, you know, were fatal and bad. And Galen says, uh, but I have seen the injured brain healed. And all of us who do this work, we have seen the injured brain healed and were more Galenic than Hippocratic. And so did Fred Plum. This is an earlier picture of him just to capture his, his intensity, right? And he wrote in the mid-70s from, from the archives that, that we, we went through uh, that, that they've studied 100 patients and by 24 hours we can identify those who cannot recover above a vegetative level who will do well. And then this is the key point. There is risk stratification. There is that middle third for whom more information is needed. We're presenting every effort at treatment must be made to know their maximal potential and how to judge their early signs. And of course, the kind of game changer that we're all kind of thinking about is the person who is minimally conscious who makes some kind of recovery on the other end. And, and I think the paradigm shift for many of us, and at least beginning culturally, was Terry Wallace, was a young man in Arkansas who, who was in a car accident in 1984. And in 2003, he had this quote unquote, as far as the media described as a miracle awakening from coma, the persistent vegetative, he, every, every particular um, brain state you could use, they, they described him. Uh, but he had been, you know, thought of as being vegetative when in fact he was probably minimally conscious about three or four months into his injury. He said first words were mom, then Pepsi. He was stuck in 1984. Ronald Reagan was still president. And um, again, the review of his behaviors were that he was minimally conscious. But he had, he had been misdiagnosed because there was no diagnosis yet for MCS. Not until 2002 was it in the medical lexicon. And even now, it's not being taught at medical schools. I was giving a lecture at Yale two nights ago where I'm on sabbatical, and I, and I was talking, we were talking about how, how come, as, as Stephen mentioned earlier, and, and uh, Carolyn Schnacker's work, the, the di misdiagnosis rate is 41% of people in nursing homes who are actually minimally conscious who are diagnosed as vegetative. And one of the reasons is they're not teaching in medical school. I said, are you guys learning this at, at Yale? We had third year medical students. Is this part of your neurology rotation? No, it wasn't, even, at, even now. 10 years, 12 years after it's in, in the literature. Wallace was unassessed for 19 years, according to his father. He developed contractures um, that, that, uh, that had to be released. His brain was getting better than his body. And, um, and uh, now he's able to uh, talk to his mother and, and say, you know, that life is good. Now that picture of him there, you know, is deceiving. It looks like he's looking away, disinterested, but he, you know, he's conscious. He's aware of his mother. And, um, and, you know, a couple of years ago, we were trying to get him rehabilitation services, and uh, I, I needed his Social Security number to help him with his congressman. And she, Angelie, and she knows I'm talking about, and we have all approval for this. I said, Angelie, what was uh, his Social Security number? And she says, hold on, I got to ask him. So she turns to Terry Wallace and asks him what his Social Security number is. And, um, and Terry mumbles a number in the back, and I write it down. I said, excuse me, was that Terry that you just spoke to? And she said, yep, first time he told us, we thought he was wrong, we looked it up, he was right. <laughs> and, and, um, and I don't know, did you show this stuff? No. So this is a, a, a study that Henning Boss and Nico and, and, and colleagues at Cornell did, and I'm not going to belabor it because I have no, no time for it. But what it shows is axonal sprouting after a long period of latency, new connections between remaining neurons in the red, the red areas in the back of the parietal occipital lobe. These are lateral fibers on DTI going uh, left to right and also a crudescence 18 months later down in the cerebellum and a kind of uh, shrinking and pruning back of that, of that sprouting, which shows the dynamic quality of the injured brain after a long period of latency. So this is a Galenic approach to brain injury. Here's, here's the letter um, from Terry, this was on the, that was a work that was on the front page of the New York Times, and here you have a letter saying, you know, we're going to look into getting him rehabilitation, okay? So, the real challenge with this, with this condition, after people pass through the vegetative state, the persistent vegetative state, before it becomes permanent, like Karen and Quinlan and Shivo and Cruzan, after three or 12 months after anoxia or, or hypo anoxic injury or traumatic injury, they go into this, into this kind of uh, zone here where they have what I call a therapeutic recovery, and they're, they're sent off to a nursing home. They are actually vegetative. Um, but they still have a, up to a year or three months to recover, mostly people who have traumatic brain injury. They're in these subacute places that are, have no medical acuity, and they start doing things that are unbelievable. And, and then the family sees them tracking, looking around in the room, saying the occasional word, all these things which would indicate that they're minimally conscious. And then they say to the doctor, can you come in and see the, my loved one? 
And of course, when the doctor comes in, the behavior is not reproducible, which is the nature of the biology of the, of the uh, minimally conscious state. And thank you very much. And, and so it's, people don't, are not believed. So that's why one reason why the diagnosis rate is, is 40, misdiagnosis rate is 41 percent. But as, as Ben Carey from the New York Times described it once, the difference between the minimally conscious state and the vegetative state is that the minimally conscious state is like the flickering light bulb. The fact that it flickers means that it can turn on. The, min the, the, the vegetative uh, light bulb will never turn on. These are the criteria from 2002 uh, written by Joe Giacino and colleagues. These are actual aspen trees from Aspen. And just to kind of, you know, uh, without being too Dickinsonian about it, uh, is, uh, is just to distinguish Terry Shiva, who was in the news in, in bioethics land, and Terry Wallace. She had an oxic brain injury. She's permanently vegetative, was evaluated by, by the courts, and, and some 23 courts uh, weighed in on her. She had experimental deep brain stimulation with that effect, um, and she was wakeful and responsive and remained vegetative. And as, as was described earlier, she has a disintegrated brain which doesn't speak to itself. In contrast, the, the minimally conscious Terry Wallace had the more favorable traumatic brain injury, wasn't evaluated for years, episodic awareness, emerged in 2003, continues to get better. He now knows, for example, the song, Bad Boys, Bad Boys, What You Gonna Do, which may not be an improvement, <laughs> you know, but he has a reintegrating brain. And again, this is stuff that Stephen showed uh, about pain perception, the vegetative brain, uh, only goes to the primary sensory area, uh, whereas the normal controls light up the pain network. This is the forward-backwards language work that Nico did with Joy Hirsch, which we down here, um, and, and showing that they have distributed language networks. Um, and, and this really is kind of where it gets unplugged. I don't know what happened. Um, can I get some help here? Um, but what, what was, um, yeah. So what, what, that, what that showed, here, thank you. Uh, is, is this notion that, that if they're processing language, right, and not processing gibberish, and I'm really, I apologize I'm giving the really short, truncated version. I hope you're not having a heart attack, Nico. No, <laughs> okay, is, is that uh, it shows that they're part of this human community, they're, that language is really central to being part of, uh, of the community. And then this is, this is ongoing work, uh, Adrian Owen's paper, The Tennis Player, and then, of course, Nico and I wrote this paper uh, making the point that this person couldn't be vegetative, they had to be in this, what we described as a non-behavioral MCS state. And then, of course, the, the Martin Monty paper, where you toggle some of these responses to yes, no responses. And of course, that patient was later found to be uh, minimally conscious on behavioral exams. But it all shows um, that, 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 there's, that, there's, that there's often a discordance and a possibility. Now, just to put some numbers on this, 77% um, of anoxic comas will result in death or the vegetative state. 50% uh, of TBI will be above the vegetative state, be minimally conscious or better. And I think this is a role for time-delimited prognostication, which you really don't have generally happening in, in most American hospitals and the importance of metrics as we, we've heard. Now, the other, the other stat that you really need to know about is that, that in, this, in this paper from, the, from NIDER, from the model systems, uh, that uh, Risa Naka, Nakasi Richardson did, um, they found that 20, of almost 22 percent of people who had an initial Glasgow coma scale of three, which is as low as it can be without being dead, 22, almost 22 percent of them regained a level of living without in-house supervision. So the nihilism, the perception that this is al always ends up badly, um, is misplaced. Now, um, so this time-delimited prognostication idea was basically, you know, let's, let's not make a prediction about where the hurricane's going to land when it's all out in the mid-Atlantic. Let's begin to, to make some statements based on how long are they in coma, when are they are going to, how long are they in the vegetative state, how quickly do they exit to the minimally conscious state. It's somewhat more prognostic. The challenge is once they get into the minimally conscious state, there's no time coefficient. And we don't understand who uh, will emerge from the minimally conscious state. Now, one of the challenges, we know where people go when they go to the hospital, they go to these academic medical centers, but we don't know where they go when they leave. And I describe this as a neuronal diaspora. And no one is immune. And we probably have about 200,000 people in the United States in the minimally conscious state, although we've never done a systematic study of it. And we, have, we were on a panel at the Institute of Medicine uh, that, were, that asked for demographic information, but that has still not been done. Um, and no one is immune from these kinds of displacements, even 
Bob Woodruff uh, from ABC News that had the power of ABC behind him and Mickey Mouse uh, was, was going to be placed in a nursing home because he wasn't making progress. Lee Woodruff said, damn the doctors and their predictions. This is my husband somewhere inside at hurt and broken head. He knew me. He loved me too, but he was scared and confused. And then four days later after that, he says to her, hey, sweetie, where have you been? And that's the question we have to ask of ourselves. Where have we been for this population? The most heart-wrenching of stories, though, is Don Herbert. He was a fireman, uh, probably more traumatic than an anoxic brain injury. He was in a house fire on December 29th, 1995. Um, his ma mask was askew. He was being hyperoxygenated. Um, and in early 2000, in 96, he had some, quite, uh, n some initial rare speech. Then he went down for like 10 years. I uh, didn't say anything. His, he was diagnosed as, as vegetative. And then one day in 2005, uh, he, he starts talking spontaneously. Um, and and um, this is what happened. I reviewed it for JAMA. Uh, Herbert is, is uh, called by his son, who's now 13 years old. His mother gets the call, your dad is talking. My dad's what? He's talking. The last time you know, he was with his father in that kind of way, he was four or five years old. And, he, and the mother says, call your dad, get him on the phone. There's this spread, let's not lose him. So Don Herbert's incredulous as the teenage voice is his little buddy, Mickey. This isn't Nicholas, he's a baby, he can't talk. Again, he's stuck in time just like Terry Wallace was. Nick responds to his dad, I can talk. Do you know how old I am? He tells him, I'm very proudly, I'm 13. Don responds with a vernacular, holy, you know what, because he was a fireman. Um, and, and, and it's amazing because he remembers uh, everybody who comes in. He's got cortical blindness, he can't see anybody, uh, but he remembers the voices and, and he's totally in the moment. Um, when, when Linda Herbert a, uh, asks her son how her fa his father sounded, Nikki reminds her, I don't know, I can't remember ever hearing him speak before. Imagine that. But Don Herbert, it's like a day in Ulysses. Don Herbert feels guilty. In his mind, he abandoned his family. Um, he says, I've been gone a long time. The next day he was a little less active and, and on and on, and then a couple of days later he fell, he catches pneumonia, and he dies. He was going to come to Cornell for studies, but he never made it. The problem with that long latency, and we have the Gary Doggerty, the coma cop, Terry Wallace, Don Herbert, and others, is, as Lamy has written, there's a low correlation coefficient between the duration of MCS and the outcome measure, suggests that prognostic statements based on length of time a person is in the MCS cannot be made with confidence. That's a biological problem, but it's also a reimbursement problem, because we pay people and, and we pay for care based on how quickly they get better, all right? And this is a, uh, the punchline here. Brains were covered by biological standard, not reimbursement criteria. And the problem is this notion of medical necessity. And medical necessity is derived from illnesses for which the natural history is known and predictable. If a patient is getting rehabilitation after a hip replacement, the course and pace of recovery is really well understood. A failure to progress at certain intervals is predictive of a low likelihood of benefiting from additional rehabilitation services. But in brain injury, if we don't know the time course, how do we know, you know, how long is enough? Now, there was this really, really important uh, court decision uh, that, uh, or, or settlement that happened uh, in early 2013 of Jimmo versus Kathleen Sibelius, who was the secretary then of Health and Human Services. And these guys alleged that th these were people who had chronic conditions. They were not getting chronic care services, rehabilitation, skilled nursing care that they needed. And uh, the allegation was that, that they were inappropriately applying what's called the improvement standard, that you have to improve. If we don't improve, we're not going to pay for it. That's a, uh, the, the notion. In making claim determinations for Medicare coverage involving skilled nursing care, home health care, and outpatient therapy. Now, this has been a universal theme and all the 52 patients that we've, that we've talked to. Everybody has had this problem. But it's been a kind of urban myth, you know, is it really, really true? But the judge in Jimmo established that, that what the, the plaintiffs were alleging was plausibly true. She did not make a summary judgment to dismiss the case. She was going to hear the case. This is Judge Reese in the, in the Vermont uh, District in the, in the First Circuit. And, and CMS, uh, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, were very concerned so they decided to settle out of court and reach a settlement, thereby establishing what our family said is probably true. There was no admission of improper standards by CMS, but they did agree to revise the Medicare policy manual, which guides local care determinations. 
And, and basically, this is what uh, the, the, the standards of the manual says. There's, there is no such thing as an improvement standard. They go off and say this now explicitly. Lack of restoration of care is not disqualifying. Um, we cannot have rule of thumb assessments about disqualifying people for care, for skilled care, and individualized assessment must be done. There's no categorical denial. that people have to get a special, specific evaluation about whether or not they're entitled to care. And that all the above determines reasonableness, and the use of skilled personnel relates to their need to provide care. And, and, and this, is, this is the statement. Uh, Thus, coverage depends on not on the beneficiary's restoration potential, but whether skilled care is required, along with the underlying reasonableness and necessity of the services themselves. Any mere co Medicare coverage uh, must reflect this basic principle. This doesn't seem like a big deal to you, okay? But, but ask, you know, members of our team, and they've heard all these stories, this is a huge, huge decision. But that's the legal theory. And now I want to just ca capture with you uh, an actual case which was resolved yesterday, okay? This is a young woman who had an enzyme deficiency that made her unable to metabolize 5 fluorouracil chemotherapy, which left her with a, a chemotherapy-induced uh, encephalopathy. Uh, she's had now early inconsistent verbalization and command following, ongoing uh, emesis. She still has her trach in place. I thought, and Nico, we both thought she was very likely in the minimally conscious state, but she was denied rehabilitation. This is actually a, a picture from the initial denial. Medical necessity, right, which we're not supposed to use, right, that phrase, has not been established for acute rehabilitation going forward of 10 7 14. Your plan only provides coverage for services deemed to be as medically necessary and appropriate. This determination is based on the following. At this time, you continue to require significant assistance with getting in and out of bed with self-care activities. Why should that be disqualifying? I don't know. You're beginning to have increased verbalizations, though these remain inconsistent. Like, that's a bad thing. Actually, that's a good thing. That means you're minimally conscious. But they never name that she's minimally conscious. Your, con your medical condition has been stable. You know, medically kind of stable, but what about, what about uh, the possibility for improvement? And services can be provided at an alternate level of care. So this is just a kind of, the, this is a, a copy of the memo that, that I worked on for, for the plaintiff and the attorney about the safety of her discharge while she's vomiting. What is her brain state? The letter was written to the patient who was allegedly in this brain state saying, your husband says you're in the minimally conscious state. Well, what does her doctor think? You know, and why are you writing this letter to her? Like, I mean, it's just so patronizingly and so, so wrong. You can't make this stuff up, right? Uh, the need for skilled services. You know, if you've got the minimum, you're in the minimally conscious state, right? Uh, you need somebody who knows how to do physical therapy and speech therapy, right? Sometimes you move, put a finger on someone's lip, you get them started. Sometimes you open the mouth and get their, their verbalization going. Also, she's got a tracheostomy tube. What, 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 what about her ability to speak if you took the trachea? But she can't take the trachea because she's vomiting. And, you know, uh, and finally, um, is there any particular explanatory model for, for 5-FU toxicity? Anyway, here's the, here's the statement from the, the, thir the third level of appeal, okay, which I know you can't read. But basically, they cite, uh, according to the nationally accepted CMS services guidelines, inpatient rehabilitation is considered. So they, they actually got the language from Jimmo that is now in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, the manual based on our appeal, and they've actually acknowledged that we were right they were wrong, and she should have received the care. So it's a wonderful thing. We were so happy yesterday. But the challenge is there's a built-in tension between regulations and their local implementation. This is a law review article by Gladio and Basile from the American Journal of Law and Medicine. It's the only article that currently exists. We're, right now I'm on sabbatical at Yale Law School, and we're working on a paper related to Jimmo, Sibelius, and brain injury. But basically, this is a really interesting point, that therapy regulations with the local care decisions, um, it appears that the regulations contemplate more of an individualized decision, that is what the policy is, uh, while the local care decision seemingly starts with a categorical exclusion of coverage um, and would permit coverage in more limited circumstances. So they've delegated the bad news to the local authorities, even though they articulate this brand principle. So this is a really wonderful thing. We need to be really happy for this particular family. But what about all the families that don't have coaching? What about all the families that don't have attorneys? What about all the families that can't go to a third level appeal? And, and we need to appreciate that access to care when it comes to consciousness is not an insurance question, okay? It's a moral and ethical question. 
and legally it's a question of civil rights. Benefits are discretionary. The provision of rights, in my view, is obligatory. And, and this is Terry Wallace, you know, just to capture this, um, this language and, and, you know, nice to meet you, good to be met. The centrality of language uh, to who he is and how he communicates. And, and Carl Zimmer, who was here, has written beautifully about, about Terry back in the day as well. And, and, and the work that we did with deep brain stimulation, the fundamental goal was to restore functional communication, to bring these people back online. Uh, it was a halfway technology invoking Lewis Thomas, uh, but, but it, it is restoration of agency by a machine through neuroprosthetics. And, and since we're here in the Spanish, uh, the Juan Carlos Center, uh, I don't know if there are any people from Spain in the room. We just lost it because um, Spain is in the midst of an economic crisis. Um, <laughs> but this is a brilliant film. And, you know, the, uh, Freud, when he wrote The Interpretation of Dreams, said that he only described, in the, describing the Oedipal Complex, described what the, the poets already knew. And what we're describing here is something that Almodovar already understood. And in this film, there were these two women. One was a, one was a bullfighter and one was a ballerina. They both have severe brain injury. One dies, one gets better, one improves. And the one who improves is minimally conscious. The one who died was vegetative. And the, the language here is, is central. Talk to her is a mistranslation. Lo siento, okay? <laughs> es una equivocación. The language here, the, the, the real title is hable con ella, which is talk with her. And what that means, the key word here is the relationality. It's with. You talk to a plant, you talk with a person. And here, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's about the centrality of language. The goal is to reconstitute language, to reconstitute communication, and through that you build community and you get to, to civil rights. I'm not going to belabor it here, but when I, when I heard about this, this study, uh, uh, this one person who kind of was able to get out of his head uh, through this mechanism, I thought of, of this uh, courageous civil rights leader, Nelson Mandela and Robin Zion, looking out that window there in his cell. Um, and I think these are fundamental issues, that consciousness is a civil right, it, and people who are conscious deserve to be recognized as conscious. The 41% error rate is unacceptable, and people who are conscious should have their consciousness augmented. And now there are possibilities, rehabilitation, deep brain stimulation, amantadine has been shown to accelerate the recovery of conscious. We've heard about Zolpin and Ambien. Um, and, and the point is they have an ethic of utter dependency on us. And we have an obligation for them and for their families because they can't go out and race for the cure, okay, because they're tethered to the bedside. Um, C.P. Snow said scientists by their very nature have the future in their bones. So we can't think about what we can do now. I have no doubt these brilliant scientists are going to figure out a better neuroprosthetic and we're going to actually figure this out. Will society be ready for it when it happens? And I will just close by saying the argument that I'm making here is, is a, is a post-Olmstead decision. The Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in 99, 90, 92. In 99, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld um, <clears throat> the integration of two women in Georgia uh, facilities into a halfway house in the community. The state of Georgia said, you know, we can't afford to put people in these kind of places. And the Supreme Court said, unless it breaks the bank of your entity, that would be the state of Georgia, you're obliged to maximally integrate people into civil society. And what I'm saying is by giving people voice you're, and, and the ability to communicate, you are actually including them in civil society. And I think this follows in a, a long line of civil rights movements, okay? From Seneca Falls to Selma and Stonewall, the disenfranchised first had to gain the rights of citizenship before they got the protection of the law. The ADA should cover these people, but the ADA means nothing to these people because we don't even think of them as persons yet. So there was a right to vote unless you were a woman. There was a right to education unless you were black. And there was a right to marriage unless you were gay. And when I tell young people today about this argument, and they look at our generation about how we thought about gay rights and gay marriage, they think, how could you guys have thought? You're a young guy, right? You say, you say, how could somebody like me think about that that way? Well, we evolved, right? I'm going to tell you that when you have kids, or your grandkids, they're going to say, how come you treated conscious people like that? They're going to look at you with the same disdain that you're looking at me right now, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, so I don't think it's an un, un, unlimited amount of, I'm <laughs> just joking, uh, of intervention, but some fundamental things, you know? Diagnostic parity, let's get a credible diagnosis. Let's make sure people aren't in pain. Um, let's give respite care to families. Uh, let's support the, the science. 
Um, and, and let's develop uh, uh, cheap neuroprosthetics that can help people. Uh, this, if you want to look at something about that, go look at Speak Your Mind Foundation, a bunch of uh, engineers up at Brown and at MGH and MIT work with us to develop these really cheap, they, as, as, uh, as uh, Dan Boucher says, you know, we get some cheap hipster glasses and we hook it up to your home computer and people who can only move their eyes can begin to communicate. So just like in the ADA, the language was, you know, these things are too expensive. Um, the average accommodation in the ADA was $300. And it's probably not going to be much more here, and it can make a world of difference. My final point is to move beyond also the rights language and also think about these prosthetics as capabilities falling upon the work of, uh, of, of Sen, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics. And, and if the brain is sprouting new axons, like young people sprout axons as they're developing, we should think about the intervention more as education than rehabilitation. And, uh, and you have these little brains here saying, I think I am ergo, and you know, it's like. So anyway, I'll stop here, and because I've gone too long, and just want to thank again the sponsors for the invitation and for your attention. Thank you very much.